It's the My Michelle Live podcast. My Michelle Live Health Watch. She's writing a prescription for hope. Here's Michelle. Hey, thank you for making My Michelle Live a part of your day. You know, we always are here for you looking for messages of hope. When we talk health, we really do stay away from how to drug yourself and try to look at ways to make your life, your health better, to prosper and be in health. Uh, This is an interesting time uh, where... Drug companies are making a lot, and sometimes we're the ones paying the price in so many ways. Today, we're going to ask the question, can you change your brain? Stay with me. We know that the world, our world, is rife with anxiety, depression, disorders like ADD, ADHD, post-traumatic stress. Well, today... We're going to investigate something called neurofeedback. Have you heard of it? We're going to ask some questions. What is it? Is it safe? Is it weird? Is it an alternative to the toxic soup of medications we are drowning in? Enter my guest. He is an expert in neurofeedback and chief of neurotechnology at the Center for Brain training in Jupiter, Florida. He's also the author of Neurofeedback 101, Rewiring the Brain for ADHD, Anxiety, Depression, and Beyond Without Medication. What? Perfect book for this subject and the perfect guest. Michael Cohen, thank you for joining me today in this. Michelle, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Well, let's start off right off the bat. Um, people might be listening and going, neuro, huh? (laughs) What is neurofeedback? So neurofeedback is very simply a gem for the brain. So think of it as, okay, if I have weak muscles, then they say that if you go and you work out and you pump those muscles, you'll get stronger. So if you practice pumping muscles, you get stronger. How do I pump my neurons? How do I increase the activity in key areas of my brain? If, for example, I get easily anxious, I get easily triggered, I get overwhelmed, I cannot shut my brain off because it races every time I try to go to sleep or I have just this racing brain problem. Um, I mean, there's lots of different issues, but my brain is not doing exactly what I would like it to do. It's not performing as well and it gets me in trouble. So how do I, how, what do I do about that? Obviously, if you go to a doctor, their tool is here is a medication to address that symptom. The problem is that medication doesn't solve the problem. It just papers over what you're dealing with. If I can strengthen my brain at circuits, in other words, there are circuits of your brain that play a role in how you calm yourself. There are circuits in your brain that play a role. Like, for example, if right now you want to ask me a question right now, but you're trying to hold back, how does your brain actually hold back and not just start asking more and more and more questions? That's actually your prefrontal lobe has breaks. And it says, okay, I probably shouldn't do this yet. I need to wait. You know, how does a, how do we control our brain at all? How do I say something really nasty to you and you not get so upset that it just causes you to melt down. I mean, lots of times people say things that aren't perfect. And how do we learn to control that? We calm ourselves, but how? Well, there's circuits in our brain that play a role in calming anxiety, in quieting the mind, in being able to go to get to sleep and stay asleep. And you can exercise those. And this technology, because that's what it is, you know, if I use weights, that helps me pump my muscles, right? So I'm pumping muscles. So how do I pump neurons? Well, you can't feel your neurons. So if I put a sensor over certain parts of the brain, it'll tell you I'm doing it, I'm not doing it. I'm making more, I'm making less. And and it literally is just telling you millisecond by millisecond or every half second, here's what your brain is doing. And your brain literally becomes better at what it's supposed to be doing, which is calming, 
quieting yeah, the mind, really actually exciting. paying attention, that kind of stuff. That, and uh, as as you talk about, uh, you know, knowing when not to talk, that could actually develop a filter. Man, count me in because a lot of us <laughs> don't have that anymore. Um, when we think of medication, as you mentioned, uh, we are masking a problem. We're treating the symptom, not the disease, so to speak. We're, we're, and uh, oftentimes the side effects, uh, I often joke about <laughs> side effects. You know, your your brain can leak out of your anus. Your uh, nose can inflame to the side. I mean, you know, there's ridiculous side effects while someone's playing uh, Frisbee out in the park and you're going, what? <laughs> When we can look at alternatives, the least invasive first, we can do less damage to ourselves and possibly solve the problem rather than just mask an issue. Some of the side effects from um, psychotropic drugs are a, a change in personality. Uh, that's that's almost dystopian and, and weird in my opinion. So that's where I wanted to talk about neurofeedback today um, and, and maybe get a little more uh, insight into what happens during a neurofeedback session. Because when people think of neurofeedback, I think in some instances, as with much of natural medicine, they think, oh, this is, this is some kind of weird, mystic, religious, you know, hypnotherapy, uh, you know, get in touch with your ancestors. I mean, what does it mean? So this is really a very science-based, a little bit technical-oriented approach to regulating your brain, you know, the neurons in your brain. In other words, you measure an EEG as an example. There are other ways to measure your brain, but that is one key measure. If I can practice getting my neurons, the EEG represents, I have a bunch of neurons firing. You know, so hopefully you do. If I looked at your EEG, you would have one. That means you have a brain. Your brain is functioning. Um, if those brain waves become better organized and more efficient and functioning more in a uh, communicating in, uh, with other areas of the brain more efficiently, you will do a better job of, again, attention and managing anxiety and mood. Let me... I'll talk about how it works, but I want to give an example of, okay. of something because we're talking these technical things. Well, what's the real impact on the life and on your life? So let's take a 13-year-old girl who, was, who came. She was extremely anxious. Uh, this is a couple of years ago, so this is pre-COVID, but it's very similar. I could have many cases. Um, she, her mom was a therapist um, and great really insightful woman, but trying to manage your daughter's anxiety is actually a very difficult thing. And so she, this girl was calling her mother 10 to 15 times a day, every single day at work saying, I am overwhelmed. I can't do anything. She, she would not go into the bathroom all day. I don't know if you've ever heard of that kind of thing, but her anxiety for some reason wouldn't allow that. It was, she was in the nurse's station multiple times during the day. And what's the mom going to do? So, yes, you can do medications, but they had tried medications, which she was very sensitive to. So she had some not positive side effects. What we do is we simply put that sensor on the brain. We measure an area that plays a big role in learning to calm. So think of it as I'm going to strengthen the part of my brain that's supposed to help me be calm, which is actually over your right temporal lobe and your right parietal lobe. So I'm kind of pointing, but... Over, the, over your right ear and over the right back of the head. So those play at least a very important role in calming. She essentially sat and watched a movie for eight sessions. Uh, and the movie would fade out when her brain wasn't doing the calm thing. And when her brain was doing the calm thing, she could see the movie and kids really want to see the movie. Um, and so your brain, just like when you learn to play a video game, you know, you may not, kids don't really know how to play it at the beginning, but they practice and they learn and they get better at it. So her brain got better at doing this task. Eight sessions in, her mom is like, I'm getting like three calls in a week. I was getting 10 calls a day or more. And she's actually now able to go to the bathroom. We did about three or four more sessions, but she was done. That is not 
me doing something to her. That is the machine simply telling her brain, okay, you're doing a better job. You're doing a better job. And she learned how to get her brain to be better at calming. Brain Does that make training. Sense? We're looking at awesome brain training. And as you say, uh, you are using it with ADHD, post-traumatic stress, anxiety, depression, uh, and maybe a host of other things I can imagine that, that centralizes in our brain, that keeps us from uh, succeeding, keeps us from healthy interpersonal relationships. Uh, it almost seems like the sky would be the limit uh, if it originates in your brain you should be able to deal with it. And I, I, I want to uh, explain what it was like for me uh, to get a brain scan, not because there was something wrong, but just seeing what, you know, what's going on in my brain. And so uh, it, it was with someone who was a sponsor of the show and they said, here, we'll give you a free brain scan. And we had some fun with it. As, I'm, as I am uh, laying in there and they're scanning my brain, they did it a couple of times. And at one point they said, sing something. So I started singing old hymns that I had grown up with in church, right? And it was crazy. No difference. I'm laying there just as calmly, but as I'm singing out, no, the old rugged cross or just a closer walk with the man, my brain is like, you can watch it lighting up. It was crazy. So it, it gives me a little bit of insight into some of the things that happen in differing parts of our brain when we're engaging in differing ideas, thoughts, and practices. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your brain is a is the most dynamic, complex system we know of. So anything that we say about the brain is understanding how complex it is. And so how well can we fix things? If I give you Prozac, which is a very well-known drug, right? So they know how Prozac works, right? No. If you actually read the literature, after billions spent and many more done, the mechanism of action is unknown. The complexity of the brain is remarkable. Many well-known drugs, yes, they have a theory about how they work, and I could get into that, but the, the real question is, how do we get this dynamic system to function better? And if those pills, by the way, if you could take them and your depression went away and it stayed away, I would be totally for those pills. But they don't do that. And when you stop taking them, you can often not only go back to where you were, sometimes you actually can get worse. I mean, I won't say that that's always true. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do pills. But right. the question is, as you said, first do no harm. Well, really, your feedback, if insurance companies were proactive, they would say, let's, instead of putting somebody on pills for the next how many years? Let's get them to actually adjust their brain because if we can stop their anxiety, if we can help with their sleep, I'm gonna come back to sleep in a second. If we can help with their attention, that's huge and that lasts for their lifetime. They're learning to adapt better. So that's really what this, is. I mean, it is a gym. It really is a way to exercise and you do okay. have to do the right exercise, Okay. but you're having to encourage the brain essentially to fix itself. I'm going to help the brain increase activity and the brain can learn that incredibly well with this very simple technology. Well, I say it's a simple technology. You better know what you're doing when you're doing well, that. Yeah. It, it is the brain, but to try to wrap your brain around that, how amazing it is to be able to uh, train your brain. And we see there's a consistency. It makes sense to me because there is a consistency. You mentioned your muscles. Of course, you can go and you can train your muscles. We know that our immune system, for example, if we stay too holed up with too many masks and we use too many uh, sanitizers, we're not exposing our immune system, a healthy immune system to something so that it gets stronger. So that when something dangerous does come along, your immune system's stronger. So there's a consistency in nature. There's a consistency in creation. We also know that we go to school for at least 12 years to train our brain in academics. So it does stand to reason that neurofeedback can help us, like a gym, 
for the brain. Now, one of the biggest issues in America today is lack of sleep. You mentioned your brain not turning off, just continuous thoughts and, and not being able to find that rest. And you say neurofeedback is effective for that. So neurofeedback is a key tool for that. Okay. So, so there are many reasons that someone might have a problem sleeping. If, if I look at my iPhone in bed until two in the morning, like many teenagers do, and I wake up, I just had a girl, she says, I go to bed at one thirty or two, and I wake up between six and six 30 to go to school. Ooh. Okay. Let's calculate that. Is that enough sleep for that teenager? No. So then I go, well, how many hours do you sleep if you don't have to get up? Oh, like nine or 10. So she is just telling us, I am getting way too little sleep every night, and that phone is stimulating, so it encourages her brain to actually stay awake because of both two things, blue light and Wi-Fi, but we won't get into the Wi-Fi thing right now, And um, but that's a big deal. It's stimulating to the brain. Let's just put it that way, and so can I complete, so I asked her, would it be okay if we, like, we trained your brain to sleep better? And you try to go to sleep a little earlier. She's like, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I don't think we can say exercise solves all problems. Because if you go to the gym and you work out religiously and you go to Dunkin' Donuts after your gym workout, <laughs> it's probably not as good an idea. So there are lots of environmental things. So we try to encourage that. But in terms of chronic sleep problems, so COVID has just magnified this unbelievably. I mean, it's like an epidemic for kids and adults. So I have a woman that came in post COVID, never had a sleep problem. And now this terrible sleep problem, she's sleeping three or four hours a night. She's in her, I say, early fifties. I mean, very athletic, eats really well, sleep, wakes up at three in the morning, can't go back to sleep. Now you may know people if you ask them, do you ever wake up early and have a hard time falling back asleep? I guarantee you, you know people who do. It's massive. How do you get your brain to stay asleep? You take pills. Okay. By the way, diet does affect this too. So you do have to pay attention to your diet and certain blood sugar issues can actually cause early awakening. So you have to control for those things. But that being said, this woman had that under control. And so really what we did is we trained a key part of her brain that helps you stay asleep because your brain waves, part of their role is when I go to sleep, I have to go through these certain stages to get to sleep. So if I have a hard time falling asleep and my brain doesn't do that, I can train for that. And then if I have to stay asleep, there are brain patterns that help you stay asleep. If your brain is not so good at that, whatever it is that got it off, and I, I'm not judging that at the moment, um, you can literally train those brain waves to get better at that exercise, which is, I'm supposed to do this pattern, help me stay asleep. And so she went from sleeping three to four hours a night back to sleeping. We didn't get her to eight, but we got her to like six and a half to seven consistently, which for her was just remarkable and life-saving. But I didn't, I didn't train her. I didn't do something to her. She exercised the part of her brain that plays a role in sleeping, and she did a very good job of it. So if you find someone who can do this with you, because it's really, a, you know, I'm a coach. I don't do the work. You're doing the work. I just have to make sure we do the right exercise for your issue. So there are a number of clinicians around the country, not as many as there should be, because, I mean, like in New York City, maybe there's 35 or 40 people who do neurofeedback. But I can tell you there are buildings that have 30 or 5 or 40 therapists in one building. So 35 or 40 people in New York City is not a lot. Um, but people are now seeking it out. And one of the reasons I wrote the book, uh, Neurofeedback 101, is just I had... I will say it, it's a little hard to understand. So even your peop, even those listeners who are going to listen to this and go, wow, this is really interesting. Go try to explain it to somebody else. It's going to be a little trickier than you think. Um, it's a little more complicated to go, I'm doing what to my brain? Um, I'm exercising it, but how do I, how do, I do that? Um, so the book really just is a really simple way to try to say, 
this is what your brain is doing. And then there are lots of questions. People have, people have various types of questions. So it's designed to be a quick read. You can flip through and find the thing you want. I've had people say in an hour, they got plenty of what they needed. So hopefully if someone feels like they need to do better with whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, by the way, I didn't put bring, I didn't talk about migraines, but remarkable improvements for migraines. Oh, like there are two studies brilliant. that show more than 80% improvement in migraines from using neurofeedback. How many neurologists recommend neurofeedback for migraines? Probably less than 1%. Wow. Probably less than a half a percent. They just don't know about it. Let's talk a little bit more about that. How does training your brain reduce migraine pain? So instead of thinking of it as reducing migraine pain, think of it this way. Okay. okay. Do they know why you have migraines? So if you ask people, why do you have migraines? They say stress. If I ask lots of people, not everybody, but many people go, well, I'm more stressed. I have migraines. So then if you ask the question, do you ever have migraines when you're, well, do you ever have stress and not have migraines? They go, oh yeah. Okay. So stress is actually not the cause of migraines. Okay. It's just that it's, they, they get told that. It ex and so, it can exacerbate uh, what you Stress okay. exacerbates yeah. everything. So how do you become more resilient at stress? Is a that's a question we could, we could talk about a little bit because neurofeedback plays a huge role in that. But with neurofeedback and migraines, there's basically a particular training over the temporal lobes that have been used for, I mean, I've been doing this 25 years. I started, this protocol was taught to me 25 years ago. And your head, so think of it as why did your brain get a migraine right now in the first place? No neurologist can answer that question. They don't know. But what we can say is your brain is pretty good at giving you a headache, right? Hmm. So you get a migraine, I'm eight out of 10, that's pretty bad. Your brain is great at giving you a headache. We just have to help your brain be equally good at taking it away. So if I get somebody who comes in with an eight out of 10 migraines, which has had, I probably worked with 200 migraines, chronic long-term migraines. Yeah. Um, and that's not my specialty. That's just people who come. And I would say 190 of them by putting sensors over starting the temporal lobes at the starting place, they learn, their brain learns to not have migraines. So it's not that I'm, working on their pain whatever it is that triggers them to have that migraine they just it just doesn't happen as much so i have a woman for example who's in her mid-50s who's a nurse practitioner she started having chronic migraines at age about 12. she she has done everything and still ended up in hospital for severe migraines at least a couple times a year plus having all the stuff at home and now she virtually doesn't have migraines doesn't have migraines. Why? I didn't do it. She trained her brain. Is that just astounding when you think of how fearfully and wonderfully our brains are created? But in our age, you kind of touched on something with the young girl and the cell phone. In our age, we have a lot of um, 5G, uh, Wi-Fi exposure, and that's something that you're pretty passionate about as well. And I wanted to take that on in our final minutes together. Yeah, unfortunately, I have now learned, and this is learned the hard way, but you know, that if somebody is sleeping within 20 feet or less of a Wi-Fi router, their brain is getting overstimulated all night. That affects the quality of your sleep. Mm -hmm. Now that might be a little girl who was a chronic migrainer because she slept too close to her router. And the, when they took the router away, migraines went away with three neurofeedback sessions. And I guarantee three neurofeedback sessions wasn't enough. It was taking away the router. Uh, I have people with terrible sleep when they turn off, and this is the simplest thing to do, turn off your router at night. You actually don't need to sleep with it. Sleep like you're in the woods. And if you can turn off, take, move your phone away and move your router away, just as a very simple step, you're reducing chronic electropollution that your cells never learn to grow up with. And so I'm a big fan because I've seen so many people sleep improve, frankly, even without neurofeedback, simply by doing that. 
That is crazy. Yeah, just the imagery of sleeping. Up. Best sleep ever is out in the woods. There is something uh, that it does not only for your brain, but for your spirit as well. When you're out in creation, it gets you out of the concrete jungle, out of the the toxic soup that we expose ourselves to. It's such a great re reset. Uh, this book, I want to thank you very much for writing it. Anyone who takes the time to take a, a subject and make it attainable so that the rest of us can understand it, it's outstanding. And when someone hears this broadcast and says, you know, I wonder if this could work for me, that's where you pick up this book. I'm going to show it on screen. It is Neurofeedback 101. Uh, Mike Cohen has been our guest. He is a, a delightful guest. Uh, this is a delightful book, and it can be a help for you. I want to thank you so much for joining us today, Mike. Well, thanks. I appreciate all that you do to help get health information out there to everybody because there's so many different things people need that they don't know. That you don't know because, well, sometimes we're poisoning ourselves. What if you could do it all just a little bit more naturally? What if you could do it less invasive? That's what we cover when we take on Health Walks. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for reading. More Health Watch at MyMichelleLive.com.